So we'll wait for one more minute to Reshma and then we'll begin. Sure, ma'am. All right, we still have people joining in. That's wonderful, lovely. Yes. Wonderful, yes, thank you, Vandana. Thank you for, for writing that. Yes, we are very eager to hear you, Ms. Vandana. Super, super. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Yes, so let's start. Greetings, my dear friends. Welcome to a very vibrant and lively platform, the Association for Primary Education and Research, APER. We are very, very happy and you know, by your overwhelming response and participation and wholeheartedly welcome each one of you here today. So my name is Kusum Kanwar and I'm the APA National Core Committee member and the mentor of territories Telangana and Mumbai, Malad Payandar. So today it is my great honor and pleasure uh, to present the Association for Primary Education and Research Workshop series by Mumbai, it's Malad Payandar Territory. A huge gratitude to ECA President, Dr. Swati Popadwats for continuously creating and fostering nurturing environments for the well-being of all children, her teams, you know, like all of us, and for every educator out there and in the country. Gratefulness and appreciation to the entire national team, APER national team, all leaders and members for constantly supporting and encouraging APER initiatives. These July-August series of free professional development workshops are organized and synchronized by two very dynamic, vibrant and self-motivated territory heads of Mumbai, Malad Bhai and the Territory. Dr. Jaya Parik, the principal of Ram Ratna International School, and Dr. Seema Negi, Director, Principal, Sanjeevni World School. Thank you for you know, uh, having such prolific speakers and pertinent topics for all of us in these COVIDian times. APER, so Association for Primary Education and Research is tailored around promoting growth mindset, which will help ignite the human greatness. APER supports teacher training and programs that help in promoting the holistic development of children by promoting creativity, strengthening self-directed learning skills, imbibing core values, as well as helping adopt a healthy lifestyle. Association for Primary Education and Research is a non-profit initiative that brings together professionals, educators, educationalists with the vision to let quality education for primary children be the right of every child everywhere. APER is one-stop connection needed by all primary years stakeholders for enrichment, networking, awareness, and advocacy for children and everything that affects them. To ensure that children in primary years are assured care and education with a smooth transition from early years to primary schools. So APER aims to ensure that every educationalist in this country gets access to latest research, uh, resources, training that I've just spoken about. So as I conclude, I thank Ms. Reshma, the ECA APER head office. Uh, you know, she, she's the coordinator for all our events and the national coordinator, you can say, for relentlessly managing all these APER events so efficiently. To all our participants, thank you once again for being a part of all APER, uh, you know, professional development workshops that we bring to you in these challenging times. So we are inspired by your enthusiasm and passion to learn and implement the golden nuggets you know, from our platform in your, you know, in your remote teaching that you do in schools. 
We also encourage you to join our WhatsApp groups to stay updated on all our initiatives. Please email your uh, name, your WhatsApp number, your location to ECA admin at the rate gmail.com. Be mindful, admin here is without the I. So thank you and look forward to great synergies here today. And as I hand over the virtual stage now to the magnificent, marvelous, and very dependable Miss Michelle Joseph, who's on our screen today. She's a coordinator of Sanjeevni World School. I take great pleasure in introducing this lively, very committed educator who has on many platforms introduced me. So here I'm very delighted to hand over the baton to her today. She's a highly evolved educator, writer, blogger, anchor, host, trainer, founder of Ray of Hope chat show. So we hope to be on her chat show one day. So the implications of her passion are multifold, exploring various dimensions. She divulged into being a writer, blogger, anchor, host, trainer, where hope is not lost, but built bringing out a real persona. The maxim that she believes in is to teach is to touch a life forever. So many of you out there are doing that. We are so happy to have you here with us on April platform, Miss Michelle. Miss Michelle is going to be introducing Miss Vandana Joshil, the speaker for today. Thank you and over to you, Miss Michelle. Thank you so much, Kusum, ma'am. That was really welcoming and a warm introduction. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for um, giving me the opportunity to be on APA. So I would like to begin by saying, it's like everyone tells a story about themselves inside their own head all the time. That story makes you what you are. We build ourselves out of that story. You know, and these stories are never ending. They're never ending journeys. They are hidden talents. They're suppressed memories, all waiting to be told. We all have a distinct definition of a story. The issue or the challenge is most of the times it's in our heads and we never let it out. So on behalf of APA, I warmly welcome each one to the professional development workshop today being conducted by Ms. Vandana Joshil, ma'am. The title being Relatable versus Popular Imagery in Primary Education. I understand what I see. The reason why I introduced the session today about stories is because Ma'am is a storyteller. She's a content writer and managing director of LAJA, that is L-A-J-A, -A, a forum for women. She's an active team member of RINS Academy Private Limited a training institute that focuses on the holistic and overall growth of children, adolescents, teens, and young adults. She has moderated many discussions online and offline and manages to bring out the insightful takeaways from any discussion. So ma'am, we give it over to you and we're all ears uh, to get those lovely nuggets, those lovely insights from you this evening. So I give it over to you, ma'am, to take it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Kusum, ma'am. Thank you to uh, ECA, APER. Thank you to Swati, ma'am, Dr. Jaya Parekh for, you know, inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to talk about a subject that is really very, very close to me. And um, like Michelle said, uh, how you know, stories are something, stories are something that we all grow up on, whether it's stories that our grandparents tell us, whether it's stories that we see on TV, whether it's stories that we read out of books, stories are something that really build the foundation to all the imaginative and all the creative outputs that we get to do later on in life. And um, this is a wonderful, wonderful way of not just connecting with the child, but also also showing the child many things that probably, you know, it's about glamorizing the mundane. 
So you could pick up an ant and talk about a story of an ant and suddenly you the wings that the ant has, which it usually doesn't use to fly, you suddenly put a cape around it and make the ant an ant man. And there you have, you know, one of the superheroes of movies these days. So that is what storytelling is all about. But my topic here is not just about storytelling. Uh, can I share my uh, presentation? Sure, ma'am, you can go ahead. Yes. All right. So I was talking about how storytelling is important. But I believe that, you know, during these formulative years, these children who walk into school at the age of 2.5, 3, 4, this is an age where you try to show them the entire world. You try to, you know, let them explore. But we also have to remember that they are, you know, still just coming out of the confines of their home. They're just getting used to being away from their parents. So this is a big, bad world for them. To make it easy, to make it fun, to make it relatable is what we need to be doing. So the topic relatable versus popular, I will start with giving an example. So, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that I wondered when I was teaching children. My children I was teaching my neighbor's kids. And I realized that there are a couple of things that, you know, we've been learning when we were kids. Uh, probably our parents learned the same. And we're teaching the, our children the same without really questioning it, without really understanding it, or without really trying to figure out where it is relatable. How do I relate this to what I see or what I'm doing? Now, to give you an example of that, uh, now, if you talk about the fruit apple, you say the word apple and immediately there's a, you know, there's an image in your mind. Some of us would have thought about a red apple, some would have thought of a green apple, some probably, you know, those who come from the hills would have uh, thought of a small apple, some would have thought of a big apple, uh, the apples that we buy from the supermarkets these days, so the kids would have thought of an apple with a sticker on it, which says that where, you know, it's place of origin. Uh, you can also go so far as to think of an apple with wax on it, which you clean off before you start eating. So that is an apple for all of us. But if you talk about fruits like durian, rambutan, or mangosteen, how many of us can quickly visualize that in our minds? Maybe those of us who come from the hills or you know from places where these fruits originate, maybe we can think of that right away. But what about those who, who have never seen it? So to take this a little bit further, I'll explain a little bit more. So I have spent my summer vacations in the Nilgiris. And I remember walking through the markets over there and enjoying, relishing, and devouring these, you know, uh, mangosteens, peaches, plums, and, uh, you know, enjoying every little bit of those fruit, uh, even vegetables like artichoke, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, asparagus. Of course, you get that now here. But when we were growing up, it was available only in those markets up there in the hills or touristy places. So for me, if somebody, you know, in a random conversation, if somebody spoke about Brussels sprouts, I had an image of Brussels sprouts in my mind. I knew what it looked like. I also knew what it felt like, and I also knew what it tasted like. But for my husband, who grew up in Gujarat, these were alien concepts. He probably read it in a book somewhere, but he could never relate to it. It made no sense to him. So when my I had children, and thankfully, by the time, you know, they were growing up, we had supermarkets which would import these uh, fruits and these exotic fruits and vegetables. So I would buy them for my children so that they could also, you know, have that touch feel. They could touch a, uh, you know, a, a mangosteen. They could peel it. They could see how the color bleeds out of the skin onto their fingers. They could see the white inners. They could taste it, you know, get that tangy flavor. So my children also relate. When you say mangosteen to them, they also have an image in their mind. Now, why is that important? That is important because that is where, that picture is from where we start. So let me come back to my topic. Why am I talking about relatable versus popular imagery? 
So what are we trying to do in schools, actually? When we are talking about, uh, you know, children in school, what are we trying to teach them? We are trying to teach them languages. We're trying to teach them maths. We're trying to bring them about a general awareness life skills, EVS. So in languages, we try to teach them words, concepts, we explain pictures, we help them make stories. When we talk about maths, we're teaching them numbers, shapes, at that, you know, formulative years. And when you're talking about general awareness, we're talking about the environment, you are talking about life skills. These are the things that we are generally talking about. But when we're trying to teach all of these children, all of this, what are we really doing? What do we use as imagery? This is a poem that our parents have probably sung. We have definitely sung it. Our children have also sung it some point in time. So let's all sing along. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. Very simple, very sweet, has a lovely rhythm to it. There is like a thup, 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 ta-da, ta-da, ta-da to it. It sounds very nice. And uh, I've, I'm also guilty of, you know, putting my children to bed singing this. When my babies were really small, I would, I never knew how to sing lullaby. So I would sing all these nursery rhymes. And there was a point in time when I was scared that, you know, once these kids go to school, as soon as the teacher would sing a nursery rhyme, they're probably going to fall asleep because that's how I use these. But then when I was singing this to my children and to the children who came to me, one fine day, I had a child who came up to me and asked me some questions which made me stop in my tracks. Those questions and that child is what led to me wanting to explore this a little bit more. So let's start with the basics. What are the questions that that child asked me? Ma'am. Are they poor? So I looked at him and I said, why are you asking me that? What makes you think that these children are poor? So he says, ma'am, in my house, when I want water, all I need to do is open the tap. I don't need to go to a well. Why are Jack and Jill going up to a well? So I said, well, you know what? This is the village. Probably Jack and Jill are in the village and they have to go up a hill and get water. And it's not as simple as that. So he thought a little bit more and then he said, ma'am, don't they have parents? Now that shook me. Why is this child asking me such a question? So I asked him again, why are you asking me this? So he says, ma'am, if I want water and I say, mama pani, mama will get up. She will go to the kitchen and bring me a glass of water or dadi would do that. Or maybe the maid in the house would do that. I have never had to go get myself a glass of water. So then I said, you know what? You're lucky, but you have to become self-sufficient. If you are, if you want a glass of water, I think you can jolly well walk up to the kitchen and get it yourself. Why do you want to bother mama and daddy or dadi and your maid? So he nodded. Then he asked me, okay, now you tell me why are these children working? Papa has told me that child labor is banned. Why are these children working? So I again asked him, what makes you think they're working? So he says, you're telling me that they don't have taps at home for water. You're telling me that their parents are home, but still these two have to climb up the hill to get a pail of water. Isn't that child labor? And I laughed because I found that question so pertinent, so heavy, but then I couldn't you know, laugh at his face because the child genuinely wanted to know. So I said, no, that's not how it is. And I tried to you know, brush the child labor thing under the cup. And I said, you know, they are having fun. They want to go to the well. You know, it's so much fun when you go to your nanny's house. Don't you go to the well? So then he said, what is a well? So that kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I said, and I realized that, you know, most of these children that children that we are catering to, we are educating, all of us are educators here. Our children come from gated communities. They come, come, they come from societies, multi, you know, uh, multi-storied complexes. They have probably never seen a well. A lucky few who still do have roots in villages and their grandparents live there, they probably still go there and get to see a well. But this well is not something that they are well versed with. 
they have never seen it they don't understand what it is now this is one example let me go to the next one humpty dumpty again a very favored uh, poem all of us have sung it humpty dumpty sat on the wall humpty dumpty had a great fall all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put humpty dumpty together again i love this poem popular imagery we have all seen it we have even had birthday parties with humpty dumpty as a theme but the questions asked here how can you make an egg sit on a wall because if you take an egg and keep it on a platform it will wobble it will fall off how can you make this egg sit on a wall and ma'am when the egg falls it will crack it will be a mess why would somebody want to get into that mess collect all those shells pieces of shells and stick it up together this is such a, a you know a, a for want of another word this is such a dumb poem now what whoever wrote this poem whenever this poem was written in whichever era it was written the, it probably had a context at that time for us now in this generation there is no context it actually sounds very funny and it somewhere you know it favorizes the whole concept that we are trying to teach our children i could be wrong here this is my opinion but i believe that somewhere children are sitting up and asking us questions like this today's generation is a generation of children who know how to ask who want to know more who keep pestering you with questions and we as parents we as educators if we are unable to answer those questions we are failing them we are not failing us we are failing them let's move on to the next one now this is a poem that i loved because like i said it has a lovely tempo to it it's raining it's pouring the old man is snoring he went to bed and bumped his head and he couldn't get up in the morning how scary is that now i remember singing this song you know clapping my uh, hands and having the children join me in clapping their hands and sing the song and stomp all around the room until one child came and asked me ma'am what happened to the old man uh so i said uh nothing nothing happened to him he's fine is he hurt why do you think he's hurt because he bumped his head ma'am and then did he die how do you tell a 3 year old child that no child the no bachcha this man is not dead he just bumped his head but then if he bumped his head why could he not get up in the morning you are understanding what i'm saying the poems are lovely they are foot tapping they keep us you know uh, they make us stand up they make us smile they make us clap our hands they make the children energetic but what is the relevance of all of this when we are teaching our children these days another easy one mary had a little lamb uh, i used to love this because this is a, like a long poem and by the time you finish the poem my child would have gone to sleep so mary had a little lamb its fleece was white as snow and everywhere that mary went he was sure to go he followed her to school one day which was against the rules it made the children laugh and play to see the lamb at school so the teacher turned it out and still it lingered there and waited patiently till mary did appear very sweet poem you can actually for us our generation we can actually imagine a lamb over there you know with a forlorn look following mary all over the place and how beautiful how cute is that but is this possible the questions asked to me were what is a lamb again when we are talking about urban setup we are talking of children in cities they have probably never seen a lamb they would have seen a goat maybe at the butcher shop they would have seen a cow maybe a cow a buffalo a calf maybe walking on the roads but they have hardly had an opportunity to see a lamb what is a fleece yes we can show them pictures of it we can show them uh, you know movies of uh lambs and you know all of that but the child it doesn't relate it doesn't that retention is not there because the child has not experienced it has not felt it one child came up to me and asked me ma'am if he is put outside the classroom won't he be stolen won't some thief come and steal it 
good question ma'am mamma doesn't even get me a dog and mary is so lucky that she got a lamb imagine the innocence and these are questions that i have not made up these are questions that were genuinely asked to me by these young children so there you have now how do we learn now this is a chart this is a diagram a pyramid that all of you educators out there have le seen learned in your trainings you've gone through this you probably have this stuck somewhere on your board too so how do we learn 10% of what we learn is what we read 20 is what we hear 30% is what we look and see 50% of what we see and hear now remember the difference there is 30% of looking see not just looking but actually seeing there's a difference between that 50% is seeing and listening and hearing to it 70% is of what we discuss we keep asking we keep asking questions we keep repeating it 80% is of what we do what we understand it as 95% is of what we teach now when we talk about children over here we are not necessarily talking about them going and teaching but we are talking about them actually discussing it with people what they learn from school whether they are able to go back home and discuss this with their parents with their peers with their siblings are they able to have this dialogue are they able to have that continuation from school right up to their homes now i will also mention a couple of things that actually are relative so let's take this poem one to buckle my shoe again a very sweet poem one to buckle my shoe three four knock on the door five six pick up sticks seven eight lay them straight nine ten a big fat hen now here this is doable this is relatable why i can count on my fingers 1 to 10 i can count so 1 2 3 i can go on like that so i can see i can hear because i'm singing it is teaching me something buckling my shoe of course now children don't buckle their shoe maybe they have a belt so they learn to buckle it themselves they learn to tie up their laces themselves so they're learning that they're learning counting like i said they're learning to buckle up they're learning to tie their laces they're using actions you know they're knocking on the door there's some action over there so when they knock they know that when you go tuck 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 that's a knock you use your knuckle this is your knuckle you knock on the door and this is the sound that it makes tuck 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 as opposed to dhar 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 the difference it's relatable the child can relate to that action the child can relate to the sound that is coming from there the child can relate to what he's seeing his reaction to every action he does tuck tuck on the door the reaction the sound that comes back of course this leads to laughter and who has not seen a hen any child whether you're in the villages whether you're in small cities whether you're in big cities whether you're in mumbai chennai bangalore anywhere you have seen a hen if you have not seen a hen running around your grandparents yard then you have probably seen a hen sitting waiting to be butchered at the butcher shop so you have seen chickens of all sizes and shapes and you know state of hygiene but you have seen it so a hen is relatable This is a poem that I picked up, and uh, I liked it. This is in Hindi, and why I liked it is one because during the course of all the searching and all the researching I did, I realized that our regional languages had more to offer in terms of relatable poetry, in terms of relatable stories, in terms of relatable content. Things that can that if a child if you read out to a child the child immediately has an image in his mind can immediately recall that i had seen this somewhere so this is about ped hamara sathi hai ped hamara sathi hai chhaya humko deta hai baad se hame bachata hai meethe phal bhi deta hai ped kitna जरूरी है फिर भी बेचारा कटता है हमें भी पेड़ लगाए हम हम भी पेड़ लगाएंगे संसार को हरा भरा बनाएंगे सो रिलेटेबल especially now when we are trying and celebrating एवरी डे वर्ल्ड एनवायरमेंट डे ट्री प्लांटेशन ड्राइव आर है चाइल्ड कैन सी द ट्रीज 
the child. This is an action oriented poem. You take the child out into the garden, let him actually dig a hole, let him plant a seedling, let him plant a sapling, let him see it grow, let him enjoy as it grows, as it thrives. What does this teach us? It's, it's consequential. The child sees the consequences of planting something and seeing it grow, seeing it, you know, these are the learnings. It's a hands-on activity. He can actually get down or, you know, get into the mud, get dirty, feel the mud, feel his roots. It's a fun play. It teaches him language. Now, words like bard. What is bard? For a three-year-old child, bard makes no sense. But when you tell him that when there is heavy rains and there is flooding, that's a bard. When water gushes, you had the biggest bar of all times we had in Kedarnath. There are movies for it as examples. That is the imagery we are talking about. The child can relate to it. He knows as opposed to wee willy winky runs through the town upstairs and downstairs in his nightgown. The child cannot relate to a wee willy winky, one, because you would not be allowed to run around town in your night suit. You know? You're understanding what I, where I'm going with this. Let's pick up another one. This is something that I came across today and I was really happy to see this. Uh, a rhyming rolling rice. Here, there's a child who's saying, I won't eat, I won't eat. I tell her so many times. She smiles and with her magic hands, rolls the rice into rhymes. It rhymes. There's a thump to it. There's a tempo to it. It's fun to listen to. This little bite for Dada Dadi, this little one for Chachu, this one, one more bite for Papa, Mommy, and the last bite is for you. It rhymes. It makes sense because every child has gone through this phase in his life. Every child, every parent out there, every educator who has meals in school has seen this. Whether the these are trying to force feed the children and say, Bacha, ek aur khale, this is you. I have done this for my children, made small balls of rice and said, okay, this is you. This is your best friend. This is the boy who bullies you in school. Would you want to eat him first or your best friend? You know, things like that. What are we trying to do over here? One is it's relatable. We're using a lot of hand gestures. We're making balls. We're feeding the bay child. We're counting, counting number of balls on the plate. There is an interaction. Who do you want this ball to be? Should it be Dada or should it be Dadi? The child is interacting with you. There's play happening. The child wants to play. The child is now invested in what you're trying to teach the child. The child is invested and engaged in what you're trying to do. All the teachers who ever walk into, you know, the doors of a school, who walk into that amazing place where you impart knowledge, you have all put in enough effort at home to learn your subject for the day and then to give it out to your children. So imagine how much fun it will be if your child is interacting with you. Whatever you say, if it makes sense to your child right away, if he has an image in his mind and he can say, yes, ma'am, I understand win that's a win that's a fabulous win social skills your child now knows who all is in his family so your your student is there and your student can tell you my chacha chachi live with me somebody else will say my cousins live with me now they know that there are relationships beyond mummy papa dada dadi there are cousins there are siblings there are uncles maternal family you know paternal people from both sides of the family there is a maid who's lived with us all her life who's taken care of me since i was a child social skills we're teaching that to the child and it is relatable because the child knows that yes i can see these people i can see their relevance i can see these relationships in my daily life oh i hope i'm not going on and on and uh, if there are any questions please feel free to ask Let's talk about a couple more relatable things. Now, this is something we've all sang. Ringa, ringa, roses, pocket full of poses. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Now, when we were singing it, the Indianized version of this was ringa, ringa, roses, pocket full of poses. I don't know why we used to sing poses, but we used to say poses. And we used to say, um, hasha, busha, we all fall down right because that's how it sounded better to us 
instead of that. Now, what is POCs? How many children, actually, how many educators know what POCs are? You have to explain that to your child. So POCs are a bouquet of small, delicate flowers. It's a delicate bouquet. You know, the kind that you see, uh, you know, the latest example that I could give you is probably of Princess Meghan Markle at her wedding when she had that small bouquet, the dainty looking, the delicate looking bouquet. That is what a POCs is, you know, a POCs is. But we, for us, it is not relatable because we Indians per se, when we talk of a bouquet, we talk about the bigger, the better. Saw roses aate hai, toh usme 150 dal do, you know, make it look that much better, that much larger, that much grander. Instead, there is another poem which follows the same rhyme, the same rhythm of Ringa Ringa Roses. Over here, I don't know whether you can read it, but here it says, walk around the circle, walk around the circle, walk around the circle, we all fall down. And then you go on, stomp around the circle. So you can have children holding hands and going around in a circle, singing this to the same tune of Ringa Ringa Roses, and then make them do different things. So there are tiptoe, you have jump, you have prowl, you have gallop, you have crawl. So many things you're making the child, you know, go through a complete workout. All the parts of their body are moving. There's, I'm sure the child is going to get really tired by the end of that session, that period. But you have achieved to keep the child engaged, to keep the child happy. The child has enjoyed himself, has enjoyed herself with her friends. And in the process, also learned things which will remain in their mind. If I, you know, uh, clap my hands, this is a sound that comes. If I stomp my feet, that is a sound that's going to come. If I crawl, this is how it looks. Relatability. Now this, again, when we talk about clarity with creativity, this is a My Body song. And I'm so happy to know that this is one of the uh, rhymes which is available in the IGCSE uh, pre-primary books. And I had one of the teachers send this to me and I was so happy to see this. So the child is saying, I have two sharp ears with which I hear, hear, hear. Again, there is a tempo to it, there's music to it. You keep doing that with each body part. So you have, uh, you know, hands with which I clap, 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 a nose with which I sniff, sniff, sniff. So the child is learning actions, the child is learning to, you know, what every part of the body is going to be used. And he knows that if he has two eyes, his friend has two eyes, uh, the girl sitting in front of him has two eyes, the teacher has two eyes, and everybody is the same. There is no no such thing differentiating us. Even if there is a specially able child or a different uh, child in the class, everything remains the same. Two hands, two legs, two eyes, two ears. Of course, if you have a class full of children who are special, then you need to change your poem accordingly. Because unfortunately, our books do not come printed with uh, such sensitive content. But we can work with it. This poem, as opposed to what poem I learned as a child, Chubby Cheeks. And I can tell you something about this. Uh, I was the butt of jokes every time this poem came up because I was chubby. I still am chubby. So chubby cheeks, dimple chin, rosy lips, teeth within curly hair. I have curly hair, very, fire, very fair, eyes are blue, teacher's pet, is that you? Are you trying to tell the child that if you have all of this, you are fair, you have curly hair, you have chubby cheeks and blue eyes, then you are your teacher's pet? See, we are living at a, in a time and age where children are questioning these things. There is a child who has come up to me and asked me, ma'am, my eyes are black. Do you not like me? So of course, I love you, bacha. You're the cutest. Children are asking these questions. These are not... Blue eyes are not relatable. They cannot understand. They've hardly seen a child with blue eyes. They've seen black, they've seen brown, maybe they've seen gray. You're understanding our context has to change. This is another poem that I picked up and I was so happy to read this. Urti Patang. Again, like I told you, our vernacular uh, books have much better, much relatable content as opposed to the English books because vernacular, uh, the languages are so rich and uh, they have so much depth. 
depth in expression, depth in feeling. And I think there is a lesson or two that we as educators, and even those who said the curriculum can take from the vernacular medium, because look at this poem, it says, Urti patang matak matak kar, pooch hilati, asman mein udi patang, khuli hawa mein lehrati, ur uda kar chali patang. Pardon my Hindi, it's not too great, but I'm trying, I'm making an effort why is this related to me? I see, therefore I learn. This is what I've been trying to emphasize. Here, with this kind of a poem, there are like multiple learning opportunities or teaching opportunities for teachers, for educators. You can have a kite making activity. So imagine by the end of this poem, by the end of that, uh, you know, that week of going through this poem, that child will remember this poem by rote and with feeling because he has felt it it has touched her somewhere deep within you have a kite making activity you have a kite flying activity maybe you can call the parents and let them come let them have fun you can talk about wind energy yes a, a three-year-old and a four-year-old might not understand wind energy in all its technicalities but you can talk about wind energy when the wind comes in from the right, the kite will go to the left. When the wind comes in from the left, it will go to the right. If there is no wind at all, the kite will fall down, it will not fly. And if the wind is really strong, if the gust of wind is really strong, your kite might not fly because it will not take off. It seems a bit too much, but it really isn't. And I'm sure all the educators out here who are listening to this right now, no, they have done this somewhere when they have been teaching children. We have used these examples. The only problem is that it has not been documented. Each educator out here has his used his or her own methodology in making a lesson easier for her class. But if collectively we can come together and say, these are the methodologies we should use. These are the things that will make it relatable to children, make it engaging then there's nothing like it. Let's go on to the next one. Yes, competition. We can also, you know, inculcate a sense of healthy competition in your children when you have activities like this with a simple poem like this. What is this poem about? This poem is about a kite. It's about a boy who's flying a kite in the wind and how he's enjoying it. That same joy, that smile on the child's face can be transferred to your children's faces because they will enjoy this. And once you do this with your child, with your children, believe me, this poem is going to remain ingrained in their brains, in their minds. Let's go on to the next one. This is again a very sweet poem that I read today, Chiti Rani. Who, what is a Chiti? We're talking about a small ant, an insignificant ant that probably walks around in your house and you squash it with your feet because you don't want it to, you know, damage any of your, uh, uh, you know, groceries or, you know, bite your child, whatever. But look at how beautiful this ant, this ant has been given character. And this ant, when your child listens to this poem about, uh, you know, uh, Sayani Chiti Rani, Meeti Chije Ki Diwani, Jitni Chiti Utni Gun. You know, you're talking about this small little ant who's capable of doing so many things. It can move big, you know, humongous sizes of uh, uh, grains of uh, sugar, grains of, you know, grains which are bigger than it in volume and size and weight. But she's able to do that. So you're teaching your child that, yes, this is very small. This is probably an insignificant piece, you know, an insignificant creature in our home. But this little ant is capable of so much. And you, my dear child, are also capable like the ant. So this poem, when you recite it to your child, do it with actions, probably catch an ant and, you know, show or probably have a line of sugar there and have the ants walk across. Imagine the kind of engagement that you're doing with your children. Imagine the kind of reactions and actions and all of that. You know, they're like sponge, these children. They're soaking it all in. It's going to make so much of a difference to the way they're going to be perceiving things. So here we're looking at it at the micro level, things they see around them. 
it increases their observation power they will now be actually vigilant they will now be actually aware of what is around them and not just things that are on their mobile or on their tabs or on their laptops the things that are available around them you know when we were children uh, there have been days when we would sit uh, you know on on the window sill looking out into nothing without really thinking about anything we'd be just sitting there and yet i think those are the times when we would be thinking of really amazing things i'm sure many of the ideas that come to you now have come from those times when you were sitting on the window sill looking into space with that blank look on your face so that is what we need to give our children the opportunity the you know the the chance to look at these tiny tiny creatures and learn from them we don't need uh, uh, you know the poem uh, in sea winsy spider uh, that that's a good one climbed up the water spout so we are talking about perseverance over there but when you have little miss muffet sat on a tuffet eating her curd and way down came a spider and uh, i'm sorry i forgot the rest of the poem but when you hear that poem i remember when i heard that poem i was petrified of spiders but today i have a child who when she sees a spider she wants to catch it in a bottle and look at it she's she's curious she wants to see and why did this come about because she saw a movie called charlotte's web where you have an ant and you have a piglet and the ant is no you have a spider and a piglet and the spider is weaving these amazing messages with her web that is the imagery which was which made an impact on my child's mind and ever since she saw that movie she's been wanting to pick up these spiders and see what they can do what are the miracles that come from these little tiny creatures it teaches your child skills perseverance resilience to go on despite how difficult a situation might be it teaches patience and takes away fear you know if that little ant is not thought of e katega mujhe infection hoga instead if it is looked at as something that can teach you something imagine the difference the narrative has changed you're just changing that narrative from something that is fearful and something that you should be fearful of you have now made that the hero with movies like ant man and all of that coming out ants have really become heroes we just need to tap in on that that with that i'm done with poems and i know that uh, you know uh, poems is something that we start off with in school we try to teach our children that especially nursery junior uh, lower and upper kgs it's fun because there is like i said a tempo to it there is music to it it's fun you can do actions and you can generally create a very happy environment let's do that let's continue doing that but let's pick up poems which are relatable which i can see which i can hear which i can feel which i can believe in now row 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 your boat again a very uh, you know a, a classic poem but how many children have rowed a boat how many have actually sat in a boat and had the opportunity to do this or maybe we can do this as an exercise for all your children you know when you whenever you sing this poem in school for the weekend you tell the parents your homework for this weekend or this month is to take your child boating and it should be a row boat and not a speed boat or one with the pedals it creates a lifelong learning for the child because at the end of the day whatever we are doing is towards that aim of being able to leave a lasting impression on our child or being able to leave an impression on our student an impression that will shape how the child is going to be in the future will shape his thought process will shape her imagination and her creativity so let's start with that i come to story books if you look at any of the books that are prescribed for these pre primary children we have books like these the gafalo is one of my favoriteest books ugly duckling jungle book who doesn't love jungle book these are good books 
these are books which have a story which have a moral at the end these are books which teach our children something but what concerns me is that we come from a country which is so rich so culturally rich we are so diverse but we have such a wealth you know volume of wealth in our stories that come from our ancestors why don't we use that you know there is this debate which is ranging nowadays which talks about how ramayana and mahabharata are not myths they are actual things that happen because you have scriptures that have documented all of that that aside maybe it's still a little difficult for people to believe that you know there was a king who was banished for 14 years who would do that to their child you know all of those questions that aside there are learnings that we can pick up from there there are stories that we can pick up from our culture from our heritage so things like um, uh, let me see if i have put in a yes i just saw that this uh, somebody's video is off okay uh, uh, this story that is there in our igc uh, books for the pre primary this year where story i think this is a story from the panchatantra you know where uh, there is a hungry fox and then he saw a, saw a crow with a piece of uh, i think the original story talks about a piece of bread in its mouth but here we have a very exotic crow who has paneer in his mouth but here can you see how it has been changed adapted paneer is something that most children love so the children can relate to it oh yes the crow would definitely take paneer because it's so yummy and yes the fox would want to eat the paneer maybe the child doesn't know what a fox is maybe the child will probably never have a uh, you know the opportunity of seeing a fox in the open only in jungles and only in the zoo but you can change the fox into any other animal here we are keeping it the fox because you want to keep that the relevance of a, a sly fox and you know uh, a you know a smart fox kind of a thing so this is one of the stories which is there in our igcse pre primary books and i'm so happy to see that it is a story taken from our very own books similar stories about the monkey and the parrots who got stuck in the uh, hunter's uh, net again a story very relevant now when i read such a story to my child i will also try to bring in some imagery that they have seen that has left an impression on their mind and a scene that you know they keep thinking whenever they are in trouble so if you remember the movie um, finding nemo uh, towards the end when nemo his father and dory unite uh, suddenly nemo and dory are caught in a uh, a fishing frenzy and they are caught in a net where all the other i think i don't know what kind of fish they are Uh, they are all caught in a uh, in a net and they are getting pulled up and nemo tells his father just tell everybody to keep swimming you know swimming down so in this the story is about how uh, these parrots you know collectively gather together and they fly in unison and they are able to take the net away with them so my example would be that story in finding nemo where nemo convinced every other fish to swim down and when they kept swimming down they were able to break the anchor of the net and they were able to go free so these are imagery see we are we are lucky to be in an age where we have movies which show all of this so pick up an example from there but again why do we want to go to the western world for examples why are we not able to take some examples from what we see in our daily lives you know it's about let's experience to learn that is what was the aim of my talk today is about how when you see when you learn when you hear when you feel is when something is relatable to you when something leaves a lasting impression on you when something leaves an impact on you and when that impact is there is when it makes sense to you and that is when it remains the retention power and the recall power goes up when you have all of this playing together so that my friends thank you
is my talk. I'm Vandana Joshil. I'm a storyteller. I have um, a page called Ardakshar on Facebook. I am where I share stories and uh, I share stories over there, stories that I write myself, stories which are meant to give some kind of a, a, you know, leave a lasting impression on children because stories are what take you to a world outside of your own. I'm also a content creator and writer. I'm the managing director of Lajja and Lajja TV, which is a forum for women's self-development and growth. Most importantly, I'm a mother, I'm a teacher, and I'm a lifelong learner. Thank you so much. I think Michelle is on mute. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. And indeed, uh, you know, it has been a session that is insightful. Thank you for expounding uh, uh, such, uh, I would say, crucial and uh, you know integral uh, you know aspects of teaching uh, that you know uh, it has to be relatable i think uh, we as individuals also always like to relate whatever we are told and we have long forgotten uh, children would also want that and uh, you know we just try to you know feed them in with information I just feed it, feed it, feed it. You know, when we have kids at home, uh, the only important thing that runs on the mind of a mother is I'm supposed to feed. So if the Absolutely. child is crying, we feed. We don't know that the child is crying because something is aching. And that's what, hap what is happening with, I think, our education system too now. Teachers are becoming mothers and we only feed and feed and feed. If the teacher is talking, if the child is talking, okay, take this. Okay, you need this and we don't cater to the problem, you know, and issues Absolutely. are all shoved under the carpet. Thank you so Absolutely. much for, 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 you know, bringing this out this evening. So I Thank will give you. it over to um, also our panelists, our, uh, our uh, participants who have joined us. If there's any question you want to ask, uh, we can take a few questions. Ma'am is with us and this is one of the best opportunities that we could grab. Uh, you know, to get answers, get insights from ma'am. So if there's anybody, you could, you could also put your questions in the chat box if you are apprehensive of, you know, speaking and I will uh, convey that and I will ask that on behalf of you uh, and we'll get the answers. So if there's anybody who wants to ask questions uh, quickly, uh, I have two participants raise their hands. So uh, you could you know, unmute and you could ask your question. There is one I can see, Kamla Srinivas is raising his hand, his or her hand. And it's Vishali, if I'm saying it right. Uh, I don't know, Quick, can you unmute or I have uh, I have given them the uh, rights to speak. I mean, but All right. no Thank one's you. really saying anything. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a question in the chat which says, uh, which is from Sangram, who says it's time to redesign our education system and make it more realistic. Uh, uh, absolutely true. Actually, I was just, you know, irrespective of the board we come from, whether it is the state board, ICSC, CBSC, IGCSE, or even IB. Let's start from home. Let's start with stories and rhymes that a child can relate to. So here, uh, it's not so much as an effort by the educators. Of course, it's a big effort that the educators can put in. But I think here, whoever is designing the curriculum, those stakeholders are the ones who need to really sit down and discuss this, discuss the relevance and the importance of taking related imagery from our scriptures from our day-to-day -day existence and use that to teach our children. I hope I answered you, Sangram. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, uh, using props and images uh, makes, uh, you know, uh, it helps in uh, students getting to relate with uh, whatever we are teaching. 
there's also somebody who's written that she uses uh, Celine Celine says that she uses the imagery of the ants when the kids are walking down the stairs yes students why can't we walk in a queue when ants can so true we, when we do that when we are using that for regular examples why can't we use these even when we are teaching our children pick up a story about an ant talk to them about that ant and you know instead of going through books and poems which like i said are not really you cannot relate to it so let's redesign our curriculums and our books if possible absolutely then thank you so much and you know it was really um an eye opener as well uh, at, at at i would say the right time uh, because right now most of us are online and very soon we might you know go back to the regular setup let's go with a fresh mind let's go with a new outlook a new approach a new perspective and something that should have been done long ago but it's never late than never so you know it's better late than never so absolutely i think uh, that is uh, what uh, you have left us with today and again i would say thank you on behalf of apa uh, thank you for such a wonderful professional development workshop that we had today uh, i'm sure all of us are empowered to think differently and also to make others think differently the first question that we need to ask every uh, you know ourselves is do i relate with it if i relate with it then somebody else will relate with it Absolutely. if i don't relate with it i don't think my children will relate with it uh, and and i think uh, it's it's about time we think about everything that's relatable because anything that's relatable is easily teachable so thank you so much once again thank you everyone thank you to our participants thank you to all our panelists thank you apa for making this evening an insightful one thank you once again thank you thank you namaste to all of you